Hello, everyone. This is the CircuitPython weekly meeting for October 2nd, 2023. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. My name is Tim, and I am sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. Uh, what is CircuitPython, you might ask? CircuitPython is a version of Python that is designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. Uh, CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, uh, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join any time uh, by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting uh, in the CircuitPython dev text channel as well as the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when that coincides with a U.S. holiday. Uh, in the notes doc, there is a link to a calendar, which you can view online uh, in your favorite calendar app. Uh, we also will send notifications out to that CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. So another perk of having that role is you'll get uh, notices there in Discord when we do uh, have the uh, need to change the meeting to a Tuesday. Um, there is a notes document that accompanies the meeting and recording. The final notes document includes timestamps to go along with the video so you can skip around and view the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 45 to 60 minutes. After each meeting, we post a link uh, for the next meeting's notes document into that CircuitPython dev channel over on Discord. Check the pinned messages to find the latest notes doc so you can add your notes for the following meeting. If you wish to participate but can't attend, you can leave hug reports or status updates in the document and we'll read them aloud for you during the meeting. The meeting is held in five parts. The first part is community news. That's going to be a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a chosen set of items from the Python on Microcontrollers newsletter, which goes out weekly. Uh, the second part of the meeting will be the state of CircuitPython, the libraries in Blinka. That's going to be a quantitative overview of the entire project, a chance to look at the project by the numbers separate from our status updates. Uh, the third part and the first of our two round robins is the Hug Reports section. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, take a moment to recognize the awesome folks in our community and beyond. Uh, the fourth part is status updates. That is our other uh, round robin section. Status updates is an opportunity to report on what you've been up to. You can take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be up to uh, over the next week until the next meeting. The fifth and final part of the meeting is in the weeds. In the weeds is an opportunity for more long form discussion. Those can be discussions that came out of status updates or they can be identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. Uh, and a note on in the weeds topics, as soon as you do uh, come up with one, if you do go ahead and uh, just put that down at the very bottom of the notes, there's a section for in the weeds. Uh, it's best to get those listed in as early as possible. Uh, that way they're just there ready for us to read off once the time comes. Um, so with that, we will get going on community news after I get a timestamp. There we are. Uh, this week in the newsletter, a uh, couple items that caught my eye were the uh, Raspberry Pi 5 details have been released. On the heels of the supply shortage uh, easing comes information on the Raspberry Pi 5. There's a link here to the uh, official Raspberry Pi 5 page. Uh, it also says there are many new features, many requested by the community and enthusiasts for modern computing. There are other links here to the Raspberry Pi blog as well as a YouTube video discussing this new uh, model of hardware. And there are lots of additional details in the newsletter. So I would encourage everyone, as always, to check out the full newsletter as well, um, where you will find even more uh, great details about this device and everything else we'll hear about. Uh, the next item I'll take a timestamp for is the Python Developer Survey 2022 results. The Python Software Foundation has announced results of the sixth official annual Python Developer Survey. This work is done each year as a collaborative effort between the Python Software Foundation and JetBrains. Late last year, more than 23,000 Python developers and enthusiasts from almost 200 countries or regions participated in the survey to reveal the current state of the language and ecosystem around it. Uh, spoiler alert, many people are using Python and 51% are using it for both work and personal projects. 
There are links here to uh, the JetBrains page talking about the survey, as well as the Python Software Foundation uh, blog post talking about this. And a couple of the high-level uh, cherry-picked stats that came out of this um, survey. Uh, there were 8% of those surveys. Uh, those surveyed are using Python for embedded development, which is up from 7% last year, uh, with 10% using it as a secondary language for embedded work. Uh, there were 59% of Python users that use Linux, 58% of them use Windows, and 26% use uh, Mac OS. And I am presuming there folks were allowed to answer uh, multiple operating systems so some folks use more than one which is how we ended up with more than 100 percent there i presume uh, the last one here we have 51 uh, percent use python for work and personal uh, projects alike uh, uh, and then 28 percent use it only for personal projects and 21 percent use it only for work projects uh, next up we have uh, open hardware month is october October is Open Hardware Month. You can join Oshawa by certifying, uh, certifying hardware as open source, becoming a member, or where it is safe due to the pandemic, hosting a small event. Oshawa is providing resources and making the community, uh, and asking, excuse me, asking the community to host small local events, again, only if it's safe, in the name of open source hardware. Hexter IO welcomes Sid uh, Germay to discuss everything Open Source Hardware Association. Uh, uh, OSHWA, the uh, uh, acronym for that, is Planning for Open Hardware Month. Uh, returning guest Aisha uh, Lifkar Wilson joins the conversation as Alex Glow explore, uh, explores the process of documenting your projects on the way to OSHWA certification. Now is the perfect time to certify your own project, uh, become a member of Oshawa, or get involved in other ways. And there are links here to the Oshawa website as well as a YouTube video uh, discussing that. Uh, our next item here is uh, for Hacktoberfest 10 has arrived. Uh, this year marks the 10th anniversary of Hacktoberfest. Hacktoberfest has grown from just 676 participants in 2014 to nearly 147,000 participants last year. Uh, there is a link to the main website here in the docs for that. Uh, what is Hacktoberfest, you might be wondering? Uh, the uh, blurb that they've got here that describe it says, join forces in virtual and in-person events to get your projects pull slash merge requests done as a team learn new skills, and meet lifelong friends. This year, we are partnering with Major League Hacking to help the community connect. Open source projects maintained by community-minded coders make the modern internet function. Support the essential work and the folks behind it is what Hacktoberfest is all about. As in previous years, CircuitPython will be participating in Hacktoberfest, marking some pull requests as Hacktoberfest eligible, uh, the list of issues, which you can find on circuitpython.org, is linked here. Uh, you can do a filter on the Hacktoberfest label, although I don't believe we have added them to the issues yet, but once that has been done, that filter on the website will help you find those. There is also a link to the Adafruit blog post here uh, where you can read more about Hacktoberfest and Adafruit's participation. And the last bit of info related to Hacktoberfest was just a heads up that the rewards system is shifting away from t-shirts this year uh, to virtual rewards as well as the uh, option for the tree planting, I believe, is still in the mix as well. Uh, and the... Uh, Next and final item from the newsletter this week is the project of the week, uh, which is a PicoW uh, air sensor uh, that is uh, logging data using MQTT. Uh, PicoW air is a tiny board to get started on environment data logging. It broadcasts uh, PMS 5003, particulate matter, and other stemmaqt slash quick sensor data over MQTT. It's also a tiny web server with a JSON API uh, running on CircuitPython. There are links here to Twitter and GitHub for that project as well, and there is a nice photo of it in the newsletter uh, also, so check that out after the meeting. Um, with that, I will tell you more generally about the newsletter. Uh, this uh, is the CircuitPython Weekly Newsletter. It's a CircuitPython community-run newsletter that's emailed every Monday. The complete archives are available at adafruitdaily.com. 
Uh, it highlights the latest in Python on hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own news or project, edit next week's draft on GitHub. Uh, there's a link here to do that. Uh, you can submit a pull request with your edits. You can also tag a tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter or email it to cpnews at adafruit.com in order to submit those ideas and projects for the newsletters. Uh, next up is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries in Blinka. And in the first part of this, we will hear about the overall state. Let me... Uh, catch my place here as well and tell you a little bit more uh, about it also. Let's see here. Okay, so uh, state of circuit Python libraries and Blinka. That is gonna be a quantitative overview of the entire project. Chance to look at the health of the project, uh, some stats related to the repositories and things separate from our status updates. We'll talk about the project overall and then separately discuss the core, the libraries and Blinka. So overall is first up and I will Take a timestamp and tell you about that. Uh, overall, across all the repos this week, we had 23 pull requests merged by 11 authors. Uh, the names here that were uh, newer or less familiar to me, so these folks might be new contributors or perhaps less frequent contributors, uh, or perhaps just a name that I didn't recognize for some other uh, reason. Uh, but those names this week are Maker M0, uh, Pettismith, and Rimwolf Redux. Uh, so thank you to those folks as well as all of our more frequent contributors. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, so then, yes, that was our 11 authors. Uh, for those uh, 23 pull requests, there were seven uh, reviewers. Um, so that's mostly the usual list of suspects. So thanks again to all the folks who are helping us out with reviews. As always, the more folks willing to review uh, is going to mean the more, you know, uh, submissions we can support. So uh, thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone reviewing. Um, there were 19 closed issues by five people. There were 19 issues opened by 16 people. Uh, and there are currently uh, Hacktoberfest labels assigned to zero issues. So we'll work on uh, getting that assigned and then those numbers will be represented here as well in future meetings. Uh, next up, I will pass it over to Scott if you're available to tell us about the core. Uh, happy to, thanks Tim. Okay, so for the core, we had 12 pull requests merged from seven different authors. I won't highlight the new folks again, but thanks to those folks. Uh, we had five reviewers, so new, uh, newish uh, or infrequent reviewers I just want to highlight are um, Paint Your Dragon and Anecdata, so thank you for reviewing. Uh, we have 18 open pull requests, which is uh, well under the 25 one-page limit, which is great. Uh, the oldest one is still 454 days old, and I believe that is um, the, the multiple uh, like mass storage units in USB, and we're, we're just not working on that right now. Um, I'll bug tack. <laughs> uh, Issues-wise, we had seven closed issues by four people and eight open by eight people, so we're only on one, which is great. Uh, none of them currently ha are labeled Hacktoberfest, so we can work on that. Uh, we have 727 total open issues. Uh, the vast majority, 607 of those, are long-term. Um, long-term means uh, is a milestone. And we use milestones to know, uh, to triage issues as we come in and uh, prioritize the work for the folks that are funded by Adafruit. So there are 10 open issues for 8.2x, which is going to be the, latest, the newest or, or the most recent stable release. And then 9.0 has 58 open issues. So that's our longer term, bigger changes uh, staple release that is at least a few months out still. Um, and we have six issues not assigned to milestones. So we'll have to take a look at that as well. Uh, those, those need to be triaged. And that's it for the core. All right. Thank you, Scott. Uh, next up is the libraries. So this section covers all of the libraries that are on GitHub under repos that are named like Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore and then the library name. Uh, these are the Python level code that allows you to interact with various bits of hardware or provides uh, helper functionality for you to make uh, your projects easier to code. Uh, across all of those libraries this week, we had nine pull requests merged. Uh, those nine pull requests were made by a total of four different authors. Um, 
So uh, thanks again to the newer name there, Petta Smith, as well as our more frequent contributors, Melissa, Dan, and myself. Uh, we did have three reviewers for those library PRs this week. So thanks to Scott, Dan, and myself for library re reviews. Um, there is a list of the merged pull requests here. Uh, they're uh, all only one day old. So this week was a week of just a smaller pull request that got merged right away. Uh, none of the uh, older ones were in the mix this week. That does leave us with 46 open pull requests, the oldest of which is 410 days, the newest of which is back down to just the one day. Uh, we had, across all those libraries, just one closed issue by one person with six uh, new issues opened up by six people. Uh, we do have still uh, just zero uh, issues labeled with Hacktoberfest. Uh, there are 645 open issues, uh, of which 19 of them are good first issues. Uh, I will note we've mentioned a few times the lack of the Hacktoberfest labels, just as a heads up for anybody who uh, happens to hear this and does <clears throat> want to work on contributions for Hacktoberfest. Just because we don't have the label in them right now does not mean you won't get credit. Uh, we can always add the label to any submissions as they come up. We'll also work on getting it added to the issues that are in existence already. Um, but uh, yeah, if anyone does want to be contributing, your contributions totally will be counting uh, during this, um, I believe it's the calendar month of October, but I don't know the specifics. But just because the label's not there doesn't mean it won't count. Um, we do have, let's see, library PyPy stats for the week. Uh, in total, there were, let's see, I always uh, don't know the comma, there we go, 178,065 PyPy downloads for the 313 libraries. The top 10 uh, libraries listed out by the number of downloads is here in the notes doc, if you'd like to take a look at that. Um, the, as well as the libraries that were updated within the last seven days, there's a, uh, a list of those in here as well if you want to uh, take a look at those. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to Maker Melissa to tell us about Blinka. Hello, so Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And this week we had well, this is for like all the different repositories that are related to it. And um let's see. Oh, um this week we oh it shifted on me here. Uh, oh, the Blanca library went down here now. Okay, uh this week we had two pull requests merged by one author, that's myself, and two reviewers, that'd be Scott and me. And um there were four open pull there's currently four open pull requests amongst all of them. And there were eleven closed issues by one person and five opened by three people. And I think most of that was my activity actually. Uh, there are currently 72 open issues. We were over 100 at some point, so it's definitely coming down. And there were, there are 17,160 downloads uh, through PyPI in the last week, and 2,119 PyWheels downloads in the last month. We are at 121 boards, and as Fumi Guy mentioned, uh, it says there are zero issues uh, signed Hacktoberfest, but um, Hacktoberfest actually allows you to put a topic of Hacktoberfest on the different repos, and I don't think it counts that. And I went through already and um, have just made sure all the Blink ones are have it assigned. And that's it. All right. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, with that, we will move on to Hug Reports. Hug Reports, as a reminder, is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start, and then we'll go down the list alphabetically or however it appears in the notes doc to give everyone a chance to participate. If you are text only or missing the meeting, then I'll read your notes when we get to them in the list. Uh, so I will get us started. Let me get a timestamp. There we go. Uh, Hug Reports for me this week. Thank you to... Uh, Jeff, we had the opportunity to get together and chat as well as have dinner, uh, so it was a great time. Thanks to Jeff for that, uh, and Plus One Hug Report for the introduction to a great new uh, restaurant up in Omaha. 
Uh, Hug Report, thank you to, uh, to Maker Melissa for working on rewriting the necessary parts of Blinka Display.io to bring it in line with the current core API, as well as another one for organizing the related issues and creating new ones to track further improvements and additions of uh, newer core modules like bitmap tools and Vector.io. Uh, and then uh, my last one for the week, thank you to Michael Pokusa for continued work on the templating engine. Uh, so next up is Charles Burnaford. Might be text only for Charles. Got a mic check from him earlier, but we'll read, I think, for now. Charles has got a... Uh, for now, Charles has got a... Uh, group hug for everybody. I, I had a couple of usages of Python, Python this week. Thank you. Um, Circuit Python, I should say. All right. Thanks, Charles. Uh, next up is Deshipu. Yeah. Group uh, for everyone. I haven't been paying attention. Hopefully, I can pay more attention now. All right, yep, thank you, Deshipu. Uh, next up is DJ Devon 3, who's text only, so I'll read. Uh, DJ Devon's got hug report for uh, Tanute, Scott, for the RGB matrix allocation fix, as well as a group hug for everybody. Thanks to DJ Devon for those. Uh, next up is Fede 2, who's text only as well. Uh, to anyone who has done any work on CircuitPython, it's much, easy, much easier to use than anything else, and it makes development fun, thanks to you all. Uh, and then Fede2 also has a hug report for Tanut, uh, Scott, and the rest of the crew for the ESP IDF 5.1 upgrade. Uh, if Bluetooth ESP comes from this, it will make me extremely happy. Uh, next up is Jepler, or Jeff, who is missing the meeting. Uh, Jeff has a group hug. Uh, a hug for Liz. I'm jealous of some of the projects you have coming down the pike. Uh, I know you'll knock them out of the park. And then a group hug for everybody that says see you all in November. Jeff is out on vacation for those that don't know, and so he'll be back uh, next month. Uh, and next up is Maker Melissa. Hello. Uh, I have a hug for Jeff uh, for a good chat made last week and for getting the Qualia S3 guide started. Um, a hug to uh, the user La Samurai Poop for uh, rewriting some of. Uh, link a display IO, which I ended up using parts of in my huge update. And a hug to pass me for creating a page about telling some of the e inks apart, which came in super handy in a group hug to everyone else. All right. Thanks, Melissa. Next up is Mark Gambler, who's lurking. Uh, Mark has a hug report for Biffo Bear on GitHub for the AS3935 driver. It saved me so much time. I think I forgot a hug for it previously. Uh, Mark also has a group hug. Uh, as I can finally listen to the live meeting. So uh, that's awesome. How, how's it going, Mark? Uh, thanks for tuning in, and uh, thanks for getting your hug reports in there. Uh, next up, I will pass it over to Scott. Hello. Uh, hug to Paint Your Dragon, Phil B, for the audio fix PR and the corresponding issue. Awesome. Thank you, Scott. Next up is Toddbot, who's missing the meeting in Out6. So I'll say, uh, firstly, hope you uh, get to be feeling better soon, uh, Toddbot. Uh, Toddbot left a group hug uh, and a hi for everybody. Uh, and that is it for hug reports this week. So next up, I will just a timestamp. We'll move into status updates. Uh, just as a reminder to folks, status updates is our time to tell folks what we're up to individually. I'll start, and then we'll go through the list alphabetically or as they appear in the notes doc. When I call on you, take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be up to in the next week until the next meeting. Uh, this is also an opportunity to provide tips and tricks relevant to what people are working on. If a discussion becomes too long for status updates, we can move it down to in the weeds. So I will get us started uh, with a timestamp first. Uh, last week, I followed up on the remaining failed actions that uh, were revealed during, but not actually related to the recent patch and release sweep across the libraries. Uh, most of them are related to referencing a core module that hadn't been put into the Mox uh, doc list uh, from actually an update that I had made further back. Um, 
I submitted fixes for all of those that I could. There were three uh, failures that were uh, different than those. They, they weren't the same reason, and they, as far as I could tell, were something related to the token or the permissions when it tried to upload to either PyPy uh, or GitHub uh, to upload the assets um, files. So three of those had that issue, and I, as far as I could tell, kind of hit a wall and can't really dig much further. I think we need somebody who can look into those repos to take a look. Um, there is a post in the Discord with that further back. I can also uh, pull it back up and post it again if that's helpful. Um, there was one more uh, that it was separate from those three that had a different error that I never really could understand the actual root cause of, uh, but it's also a weird one because it does, it, it says it fails to upload the files to the GitHub Assets page, but those files do show up on the GitHub Assets page, so it seems successful uh, other than the fact that it prints a message that says it failed. So uh, that one's kind of odd and I couldn't really figure it out. Um, the uh, other thing that I worked on uh, before I went out of town last week was uh, wrote the first draft of a simple test script for the ESP32 S2 TFT. Uh, this was a concept discussed in the weeds a couple of weeks back, um, but when I wrote it, I did not have Wi-Fi access at the time, so I was kind of working on the, the sad path, uh, so to speak, instead of the happy path. I need to retest it now that I'm back home and I have a real uh, network I can join, make sure it's good, and then uh, I'll get that submitted um, as a simple test for that device. Um, for this week, I am working on enhancing the automated releaser utility that I uh, was working on last week. I am removing some of the hard-coded values and adding functionality that will prompt the user to select uh, what the new tag should be, as well as enter the title if one was not supplied with the configuration variable. So this will make the utility more generally uh, helpful is the, is the goal, hopefully. Um, I also, for this week, am going to be testing the ADT7410 uh, rewrite PR. Um, I think I mentioned it a week or two back, but didn't end up getting into it. But I do still have the sensor sitting here on my desk um, to look into that. And then the other thing uh, that popped up that caught my eye was all the work on Blinka Display I.O. So I'm hoping to uh, snag some time to try out the latest version of Blinka Display I.O., especially with the Pygame Display Library, and then uh, work on any fixes that are needed for that Pygame Display Library, uh, if there are any, to work with latest version of Blinka. Uh, and that is everything that I have got. Uh, next up is Dan H, not at the meeting, but Dan says, continuing with MicroPython uh, version 1.20.0 merge, working on board builds. I have several boards compiling and I can do things in the REPL. Uh, boards, uh, uh, builds are bigger for some reason and I'm researching why. Uh, next up is Deshipu. Right, so I've been trying to write a version of the keypad library that works with touch because I need that for, for some of the of the boards I'm, I'm using and uh, that's for uh, SAMD21 and SAMD51 platforms uh, only and uh, I was hoping to, because uh, there is this QTouch library by by uh, our microchip, but it's a commercial library that that is uh, able to do this and it it can do interrupts on touch. So I was hoping to use that. Uh, unfortunately, there is very little documentation on how to actually use that, mostly because they sell that library. So the I assume the documentation uh, is all there with the, with the library documentation when you buy it. So uh, I failed, uh, I, I've given up on doing that and uh, the next, uh, I have one, one more approach I want to try, not using interrupts, but kind of uh, scanning in between of the ticks of the, um, of the keypad interrupt. But uh, we will see how that goes. So, so well, it's possible I, I will give it on that as well. And uh, the second thing that uh, caught my attention, I, I always wanted to use the April Tax library, which is basically uh, graphical fiducials that you can track with a camera. 
for my robot, uh, for my robot projects, it, it could be useful for all sorts of uh, camera tracking projects, I suppose. And uh, it works uh, with OpenMV. The OpenMV people has it Im have it implemented in their code. So I was hoping I could port that to ESP32 uh, to use it in CircuitPython as well. So I started working on that, but uh, that is also a huge amount of code in their like custom custom uh, matrix operations and custom mathematical uh, things that I don't fully understand and so on. So also not not uh, having much hope with that. But uh, I also discovered that uh, the library that we already use in CircuitPython for QR codes uh, is able to also return the coordinates of the QR codes that it found. So I'm now <laughs> in the weeds. There is a topic on uh, how to expose that to Circuit Python, and if we expose that, I could use QR codes instead of video shells, which is not optimal, but uh, still a pretty interesting use case, I think. That's it. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Dushupu. Uh Next up is DJ Devon Three. It's text only. Uh, DJ Devon says, "I'm in the mountains. They have raccoons and skunks as pets. A lovely remote place with internet." Uh, next up is 88CC, who is text only. Uh, 88CC says, "Working on RP2 port of the underscore BLEIO module. Have a skeleton implementation in place uh, that I'm filling in with functional code." Plumbing the depths of background callbacks, delighted to see that CircuitPython has limited uh, multitasking. Uh, 88CC also says, seeking working CircuitPython BLE examples for testing, also seeking Wi-Fi examples to ensure coexistence. Um, the, uh, and I would just add uh, quickly, the BLE repo, Adafruit CircuitPython uh, BLE, uh, is good for examples for... ELE stuff, and then there's also some libraries that are higher level um, that have examples in them as well. And then for Wi-Fi requests and many MQTT libraries are great places to find example code for uh, stuff that will use Wi-Fi. Um, next up is Fede2. Fede2 says, I've just finished porting CircuitPython to the ESP32 micro mod that SparkFun uses for their weather station, and I'm finishing up with pins.c and we'll send a PR. Uh, nice, that sounds pretty cool. Uh, and then Fede2 also says, recently got some Milky Duo boards to test both Blinka on top of Linux and Tiny USB, as mentioned on a previous Weeds topic. And next up is Maker Melissa. Uh, okay, so last week I finished updating the Blinka display IO, so that monochrome and grayscale displays are now supported. Um, that's been merged in, and then I also finished a PR to add e ink display support to Blinka display IO. Uh, this week I am working on writing a learn guide for the new Qualia S3, and afterwards I'll probably work on getting back to testing out more displays and e inks in uh, Blinka display IO and adding examples to the appropriate driver repos. Uh, then I'm going to probably be, work, be working on updating learn guides uh, for running the displays in Python. And that's where I'm at. Nice. Thank you, Melissa. Next up is Michael Pocusa, who's tech, uh, text only. Michael says, finished working on the Adafruit template engine, waiting for it to be released. Then I'll add examples to Adafruit HTTP server library that utilize it. Uh, created a wrapper for Adafruit HIDs mouse for uh, mouse class, I think that is, for drawing shapes based on SVG or uh, SVG path and or both cubic and quadratic Bezier curves. It can also be used uh, for just more complex mouse movement than up, down, left, right. And there are some photos here uh, in the notes doc that kind of um, add a lot of context to what this is talking about. Basically, it looks like a way to convert the data that's inside of an SVG uh, into something that you can put in your Python code uh, that is utilizing Adafruit HID, and then it can draw that shape on your computer using your mouse. So if you open up Paint or whatever 
Photoshop, some kind of program that lets you draw with the mouse, uh, it, it will replicate in your beginning shape, which is super fascinating. So uh, cool stuff there. Uh, next up is Scott. Hello. Um, so I submitted a quick partial fix for the RGB matrix crashes. Basically, if you recreate the RGB matrix enough, you run out of uh, supervisor allocations, which causes problems. Um, it's still not perfect because uh, supervisor currently will move memory, and we don't tell Protomatter that. So there's a it's it's possible that Protomatter will use the memory even after we've moved it, which is not good, um, but is probably less of an issue than the leaking of the Protomatter allocation or the supervisor allocations. Um, I also submitted a PR for re-enabling RGB matrix on the ESP uh, in main, so that the the crash fix is on eight two, and then the the re-enabling is on um, on main for five one, ESP five one. Uh, that also includes changing the refresh uh, function call uh, on frame buffer I.O., which uh, makes it match display I.O.'s refresh call uh, because it is way saner and it actually refreshes when you want it to. Um, it's like, yeah, frame buffer was using the old version. We updated the display I.O. version, but did not update frame buffer I.O. So that'll be good. And that'll be helpful for the dot clock, dot clock displays that also use frame buffer AO. Um, and then uh, I have some bigger work to do around these supervisor allocations that are so bug prone. Uh, basically, in MicroPython 120, they add the ability to split the MicroPython heap. So it's not just one big allocation that takes the rest of memory. Instead, it's a bunch of smaller allocations that um, can grow based on the, like, the underlying heap. So, so there's a heap that lasts the whole time you're running, and then there's a heap that um, that MicroPython allocates objects into. Um, and that's basically kind of how we have to work in the ESP port anyway. And so we're gonna, I'm gonna make it work that way on all ports. Um, and the huge advantage there is that any time is that we can allocate to that outer v, outer heap, uh, even if the VM is running. Um, so for these cases where, you know, we need a proto, proto matter, matter frame buffer, we could do it to the outer heap and then we don't have to move it, which is just way simpler than doing all of this supervisor move stuff. So, uh, that's what I'm going to do this week. Um, and it does depend on MicroPython 120, which is not merged in. So I'm going to coordinate with Dan on this work as well. Um, yes, it will affect low memory platforms. Um, I expect us to have to do some tuning. Um, one of the perks of doing this is that there's a couple of places, and displays is one of them, where uh, we statically allocate, um, and we don't really need to, right? So right now we have this hard limit for all but one board, where it's like one display uh, is all you can do. Uh, but the only reason we do that is because we statically allocate space for that one display. Um, so if we move to a world where we can actually dynamically allocate it, uh, we could do an, any number of displays as long as it fits in memory. Um, how that performs on the SAMD21 is, uh, you know, I think we'll get um, fewer static allocations, which should leave more memory overall. Um, but uh, we'll have to, I, I expect we'll have to tune like the memory splitting uh, so that it works pretty well, even in constrained environments. Um, so yeah, obviously, like we want to make sure that all of the example code on and Lord works, and and I know, Radimir, that you have stuff too. So um, it is going to be another big change with 9.0, but I think uh, it's going to simplify code a lot, make it less buggy, and also make it easier to do um, do do dynamic allocations out that don't apply to Python, but happen when Python is running. Uh, so it's going to simplify things. Um, for example, on the SAMD21, we, when we're writing to the file system, we need a 4K buffer. Um, and we play all these tricks in there to say like, oh, if Python's running, we'll try to allocate it on the Python heap and blah, blah, blah. 
And then when, like, once we allocate it to the Python heap, we have to worry about turning Python down and keeping it around and blah, blah, blah. Um, so that's one thing on the SAMD21 specifically that's going to help, uh, that's going to make it simpler too. So uh, yeah, there's, I, I fully expect there to be some teething issues uh, and we're going to kind of, we're going to have to tune it, but overall it's going to make things simpler. And uh, I think this is going to better align with like the direction that we're going with, uh, that MicroPython is going as well. So yeah, yeah, I don't expect it to be perfect, but I think it's the right direction to go. Uh, lastly, um, there's a current pull request from Pimeroni uh, where I'm pushing them to make uh, native IO expander support and also expanding some internal APIs so that you could pass something that's not a pin. So if, specifically like on four wire for displays, they want the chip select pin to be on an IO expander. Um, so I have ideas on how I want to do this, but I don't have the cycles to do this because I'm going to do the allocation stuff. So if that's interesting to anyone, please let me know too. And that's my long-winded update. All right, thank you, Scott. And that is it for status updates. So the fifth and final section of the meeting is the in the weeds section. Take a timestamp for. Uh, let me also find this. Scroll away from my apologies. In the weeds, uh, this is an opportunity for more long form discussions. These can either come out of status updates or have been identified ahead of time. We do have a couple of topics down in the weeds uh, noted in our document. So I will uh, turn it over to Deshipu if you want to uh, introduce your topic to us. Okay, thank you. So, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm looking into QR codes a little bit now because I have this Xiao Sense board with a built in camera. It's very nice on the uh, ESP32 S3. So, a lot of uh, memory for, for dealing with stuff and a lot of processing power. So, it would be nice to have uh, some you know, vision algorithms in there to, to build some interesting projects. And uh, one interesting thing you can do is uh, tracking objects that are somehow marked. And uh, the, the usual way of doing that is by using Fido shells. I looked into that, but uh, it will take me a, a while, if ever, to, to get that library working. So I also looked into QR codes because Fido shells kind of look like QR codes. And uh, the mechanism is very similar. Of course, QR codes are not designed for this particular use case. But still, if uh, when I looked into the C library that uh, we use in CircuitPython to, to read the QR codes, it turns out that the, it's, it's a two-step process, that library. First, it finds all the candidates for a QR code on the the frame basically that it has and uh, saves its co the coordinates of those and then as a second step uh, you can ask it to decode the actual data from a QR code uh, a particular QR code that it found so right now the way the library works it just makes those steps uh, right away so it, it goes through all the QR codes it found and decodes them and, and returns the list of decoded QR codes and uh, skips the ones that were too small to decode. And uh, I was thinking if we somehow exposed the information about the found, the coordinates of found QR codes, then we could do uh, a kind of tracking thing where you know if if you have a camera mounted on some uh, some servers that can move you could turn towards uh, to center on a QR code for instance to to better read it or or you can if it's a like a mobile robot you could even you know follow a QR code or go mm -hmm. towards it uh, i think that opens uh, a lot of interesting possibilities now, uh, how to expose that? We can. We ha basically have two choices. We could uh, 
Just use the existing API and add more information to the list that is returned. When, when the QR codes are decoded, basically return the, it's the coordinates of four corners of the QR code. So we could add that to the data that is uh, returned. And that's, uh, the advantage of that is that we know which QR code data goes with which coordinates. So we have this uh, mapping between data and, and which QR code it is. The downside is that we are losing those QR codes that couldn't be decoded, and that the operation, uh, that this uh, finding and decoding operation takes longer than just finding them. The other options, uh, option is to add a separate method, just find the QR codes and like potential QR codes and their positions and uh, not decode them right away. Uh, and then you can use uh, the decode operation like once again, once you know there is a, a QR code that is close enough, you can compute the, the size of the QR code from, from the position of its corners, for instance, and guess if it's big enough ready to, to compute or whatever, or if, if you are not even interested in the data, in the QR code, you just want to know where, where the QR codes are, you can just skip this entirely. So, uh, I, I linked to a, a, a issue for that, there is some discussions with some, some other ideas in there. Uh, as well. I'm willing to implement this. I want to implement that. So so basically I just need uh, opinions on, on how we can do this best. Do you expect that you want the positions that aren't decodable? Uh, or would decodable ones be enough? Well, that's the, the thing. Uh, I don't know how people are going to use this. I'm asking how you're going to use it. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to use it on, on my robot to, to follow and to, you know, to do things. So I'm going, on, I'm going to only decode the QR code if it's large enough. So I'm going... But you I'm do want the to, small ones. Yeah, I, I, will, I will scan for the small ones and I will... Potentially I can walk towards the small ones to make them bigger. Mm -hmm. And then only scan them if they are big enough. No, but but uh, I think it's potentially potentially interesting to have also information. Oh, okay, there are other QR codes on this image that uh, are too small to decode, but they are still there. So so you know. Right. Well, one thing I thought was like you could just like we could document QR info as like having n none payload bytes. Right, so add position to QR info and then also it will not feel, add, yeah. allow it to be none. Right, add, add, add an argument to the function that, that uh, doesn't filter the ones that couldn't be decoded. I wouldn't even, I guess I wouldn't even do that. But I guess you need that for backwards compatibility. Yeah, I, I, that, that, yeah. that would, would actually... Work. I don't think anybody's using this though, so I would maybe say, <laughs> yeah, that's that's another thing. Like, just do it in nine, and we'll just say like now you could have these as optional. Like right. now, now you'll get the ones that don't have payloads. And another another option is to uh, you know r right now it like finds all the QR codes, decodes all of them, right. and returns the information as a named tuple. You have all those fields in there, but it's uh, in, under the hood is a named tuple. Yeah. Uh, we could have it return a custom object. Right. It has its own methods. And then the, the, the coding, for instance, could be a method on that object. Yeah. Yep. So you would only decode the QR code that you actually want, not all of them. Right. Uh, for instance, uh, I think it would make, for like the usual use case of just scanning a QR code, just want to decode the largest QR code, QR code you have, right? On, on, in, in your camera, you, you yeah, don't it's, also, it's probably also the only one, right? Right. The 
most of, of the time it will be the only one and and uh, you know so so we could have you know a helper function that sorts them by size and picks the first one and only decodes that one i i wouldn't even worry about that <laughs> yeah i mean um, uh, this is this is you know this is i think like, that's fine um you could change the decode function to find and then add a decode method on QR info. Uh, yeah, that that's uh, another way to do it. And then I, I, I could I, I guess I could have helper properties on that that actually give you not just coordinates but for instance the size of the right. Yep. That could be interesting. Yeah, I guess I would say overall just change it to make it work for you <laughs> <laughs> like this was this was mainly added for like an upcoming adafruit camera board um, as a demo so the the only stuff that we'll have to update is like some demos that that jeff has put together for a product that is not released yet so um, i think it's fine to to make it a bit more flexible for you and and we can update things as we okay as we thank you that. And we'll just call we'll just call that nine point <laughs> <laughs> We'll just do it in nine. We don't have to do it in eight, and uh, and we'll just update it. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so it sounds cool. All right. Uh, and our other in the weeds topic uh, is from Carter. Uh, Carter, do you want to introduce yours? Sure. This is um, you know most of this is just me kind of catching up on something that isn't new. Because that uh, pull request, which is closed at a link, is I think it says like seven months old or something. But I came across this happening because I got a guide feedback for the display I/O guide that said, uh, "Please update this to the, uh, the the new API change." And that kind of went digging into it and learned about it. And I'm okay with doing the guide update change, but then I had asked the bigger question. I was doing this in Discord on Friday, and I think Dan was the only one around thinking about it was like, okay, how are we going to update all of the code we've got out there, which is what this uh, pull request was kind of asking the question. And it looks like the, um, the answer was going to be deferred. So the PR was closed. I'm wondering if we're getting close to that event horizon where we need to start figuring out what we're going to be doing about this. Yeah, I think we probably are, especially I think the big key is that there is a 9.0 out now. Uh, and there wasn't back when this was made, and that 9.0 is, if I recall correctly, is such that the new way works and the old way does not work. I think 8 was the one where both, uh, where both worked. So we definitely, I think, um, anytime we're looking towards 9 becoming stable, we are also looking towards needing to do that, basically, in, in conjunction with it. Um, and I would say, I mean, from my perspective, I think it's probably fine to work on this at any any point now. Um, it was a little early back then since we didn't have the new version, but I mean, in, in my mind, now that there is a 9 that's available that you can download, it's not the, I don't think it's the primary release or whatever, but it's out there and available. Well, it's only absolute latest. We don't, we haven't oh. tagged a pre-release yet. And we're waiting to do the MPY stuff until 120 is merged, because 120 is going to change the MPY format again. Okay. Um, but I, I, I think that's actually less important here. I think the decision that we should talk about here is, are we okay turning all of the 7x bundle stuff off? Uh, because, and, and this is what we've done, is like at some point we say like, we're going to freeze kind of like the 7x bundle world. And then after that, we can remove all the backwards compatibility to 7. Uh, gotcha. yeah. So I think that's the decision we have to make is like, are we going to stop building new library stuff for 7x? And I, I personally am comfortable with that because I think we're well into 8 being stable. Um, but that's if anybody disagrees with me, now's the time to bring that up. Um, so for the issue, it's actually about like, uh, CircuitPython 6 stuff, and that's just like, at this point, 
I don't think that needs to be included in the examples, regardless of whether the we have the seven stuff included in the bundle or not. What is? Okay, so the issue that's linked in um in oh, it's here less than seven. Yeah. Oh, okay. This. Yeah. yeah. And I already uh, have a PR in for the SSD sixteen eighty to remove the old six point oh stuff. This wouldn't this, it also be seven? Yeah, this. Well, what thing. it was, it was oh, codes that could work in equal. six or seven, or ones that worked in seven and and more. And so, at this point, well, uh, I think removing all that uh, is a non-issue. Well, this this change here is getting rid of show in, and replacing it with the root group assignment. Yeah. Okay. That's correct. And show works in seven, but it. Okay, so I thought this was about uh, like uh, in some of the examples that said like run this code for six and seven and run this code for seven and later. I thought that's what the issue was. Yeah, um, so we 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 should be able to remove six support from yeah latest okay. versions of stuff. That bundle has already been frozen. Uh, but the, but in yeah. general, that's kind of the the question. Still to the question, because you know, as soon as this happens, all of the existing code is essentially going to break. Because I can see what everyone's going to do. It's like Nino's out. Like, oh, I'm going to go grab the latest, the update to Nino firmware, and they're running some cool learn example from years ago, and it's going to all of a sudden break. And we've got tons of CP code in the learn repo that's doing display show. I mean, have we I, have we actually removed it? No, not yet. You no. haven't. You haven't. You haven't yet. So maybe this this conversation may be premature. But I feel like we're getting close to where this this is going to happen, right? We I mean, probably want you do a nine right? nine X release. Yeah, but nine X is nine X stable is quite far away, like months. Okay, so so let's let's just like we don't even have an this. alpha yet. Uh, okay, okay. There, right. Okay. So, this, like I said, this is me kind of catching up because this is the first time I kind of saw this API change. Yeah. And I guess it does. It does say it'll be removed, so we could do that. Looking here, the right. the like You're, warning. Yeah. The warning on show is that it will be removed in nine. So correct. We should do that. We haven't yet, but we should. And you you will do that when nine comes out, correct? Right. Right. So that's. So if we're if we're far away from that hitting, then I guess we can just defer this discussion to that point. But you kind of see what's well, going to happen. It's ex and I kind of have, have the exact same questions. Bummy guys brought up in that pull request, that second bullet. Like, how exactly are we going to change things when it? Well, when it does so eight happen? has both, right? Eight eight mm -hmm. has show and it has root group, right? So we update everything for the new API. And everybody's has that available in eight, right? So this is this right. is we got to move people off seven onto eight in order to be able to update the libraries. And the, and the way that we've kind of done that, and Fed A two is saying like CircuitPython long term support. Well, our answer to that is basically you can download the old version, you can download the old libraries, right? And I think there is a place in the learn system where we have like. If you're using this old version of CircuitPython, here's the late, here's the last bundle we built, where you can get all the libraries for CircuitPython five or six or seven. Um, so I think the first step is to turn bundles off for seven, and then we can link to that, and now we can assume with all of our code that we're running on eight or newer. I see what you're saying. Yeah, that makes sense. In the same way that we should be able to assume that we're running on six, or we're seven, we're currently running seven or newer in our libraries. So it sounds like we could start making these changes, right? Since, I think since both are supported, and then the answer for anyone that runs into this, I guess two answers. One is like we'll just update to the latest firmware so that your the code example matches the API. And in those weird cases where, for some reason, people are wanting to run old stuff, it's like you said, you can go grab it. Right. But I guess the, the one hanging thing there is, I guess maybe they're kind of on their own for this, is they will have to change 
the root group equal back to show in any code example, right? Correct. Yeah. And I can talk to that in the display I.O. guide. Like, mention that at this version break, the old way is this, the new way is this. Right. And just kind of, if you're using old versions, do this. New versions, do that. Well, so I think, yeah, so I, let's not make those changes until we have that final 7x bundle, which we could, you know, do, we could make the change today and do it, to, and we'll get it tomorrow. Um, or today's 7x bundle will be the last one. Um, but we shouldn't start making changes that will break on 7 until we're done making bundles for 7, I would say. Okay. And, yeah. and the answer to that second question in the PR bullet about should we use different wording is, is no. Basically, we're just going to do a simple show is going to go away and it's going to be root group equal. Right. And that's, that's it. Okay. And then should it... So... When that PR was submitted, I put both versions in there with the the one that's old, quote unquote old, the going away was commented out. Would we want to still include that or just get rid of it altogether? And only put right. That's, I get that's that's the question. Yeah, I think I I like what Carter was saying. Is like in the guide we can include that, but I would not include it in all the sample code, okay. right? Because in all the sample code, it's complexity that people generally won't need. Right, like generally, people right. I, I agree. This is stable. This this whole commented out code thing is is hit or miss. It's yeah. it's 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 it's, a, it's an imperfect answer to. A, we get a lot of feedback of like, well, I want to see what is the code for this board, this button, and this pin. Yeah, I mean, we try to like have a huge comment out code block. It's like, okay, if you have this board and this button, you know, uncomment this, but. People just kind of get wrapped around the axle of reading all of that and knowing exactly yeah. what to uncomment, comment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so definitely. But, then, uh, but other people want to see it. But I think I, I agree with Scott. Let's just, you know, it's just so no, you wouldn't have what's in Fummy Guy in your PR. It would be display show goes away and line and 27 just, display root group equal goes in. Yeah. Okay. And then, yeah, End I, won't, story. I won't do any. Thing on that until the bundle it sounds like after the seven X bundle. Yeah, so I I've got it pulled up all. Is that I, right? I've got the okay. Uh, the, it, 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 me, yeah, it sounds like you're you're volunteering to stay on top of this and um yeah I can do the work when it's time to do it. it when the time when the time comes around. Yeah, this is what this target okay, version awesome. Python file yeah, is what I, dictates what we build. Uh, are there any other API? As I was say, are there any other API changes planned for nine point zero besides the removing of show? I I, I haven't done that. Uh, I haven't looked. Okay. <laughs> we'll have to we'll have to look for more comments like that. And generally, we have issues like we have an, a label for um, we have a label for. Uh, breaking or breaks API on CircuitPython. So hopefully okay. we have issues for those um, as well. Melissa, I know in your display code, you replicated the display limit, but I'm also hoping to get rid of that <laughs> in nine. Um, so, so yeah, hopefully we'll get rid of that too. Um, should we reopen this, uh, or I, really how I should phrase this is, it's going to be much easier for me to remember to do this if I reopen this thing, because uh, then it will show yeah, back up ahead. in my notifications and everywhere. Yeah, I mean, the conclusion was, like, let's defer it until people are on 8, and we're definitely in that place now. Like, if you're still using 7, you know, because, like, we're doing bug fixes for 8. And so, like, we're not, we're not going to do any more bug fixes for 7, so people, people need to update. Um, People need to update. <laughs> so I'm going to make a PR right now where I delete the 7x bundle. And then once we have 120 merged, we'll start doing 9.01s. Sounds good. Yep. Sounds good. Thanks. All right. Sorry, I am here writing a reopen but it's actually everybody's waiting on me to wrap up let me get to the correct window
Apologies. All right. To the bottom, wrap up. Uh, okay, I went past it. All right, uh, so that is it for the meeting this week. Thank you to everyone who uh, participated. The, let me get, there we are. Okay, that was uh, the weekly meeting again for October the 2nd, 2023. Thank you to everyone. Uh, if you do, uh, as noted at the top of the meeting, if you want to help support CircuitPython and Adafruit and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from the shop at adafruit.com. The video of the meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be made available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. You can visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to that. Uh, the next meeting, I believe, uh, on the calendar is scheduled for the usual time of Monday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. I don't. I don't think. I don't think so. I don't think so. I just. I think it's... a minute ago, Indigenous Peoples Day, but I did see, at least on my calendar, it showed. Uh, but it sounds like maybe Tuesday. The, then. the host, the host calendar is still on Mondays, but the actual public calendar gets shifted. Uh, okay, I'm always looking at the host uh, calendar. That's probably where. I'm. So next week yeah, we're on Tuesday. Yeah. My apologies. Next week is yep. Tuesday, the uh, 10th of October for next week at the normal time of 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, 11 a.m. Pacific, but on Tuesday instead of Monday. So adjust your calendars. And a uh, reminder for folks with CircuitPythonistas role, uh, you'll get pings in Discord um, as a reminder for that as well. Uh, let's see here. I've lost my spot again. There we are. Uh, the meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can uh, join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. Um, to be notified of changes in the meetings, just like I mentioned a moment ago, you can ask to be added to CircuitPythonista's role on Discord. Uh, that's all for this week. Thanks, everyone, and we will see you all next uh, week on Tuesday.